Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Together, we'll uncover secrets that only stones from antiquity can reveal. Please subscribe to the channel to show your support for this line of inquiry. That drives me to make more of this content for you. The Great Pyramid of Giza, famed for its record-setting size and precision in alignment, is full of peculiarities inside. One of the most vexing and confusing inner structures is the well shaft, and by extension, the small grotto that it intersects on the way down. What I find most frustrating about the well shaft isn't so much its confounding design, but rather how it serves as a get-out-of-jail-free card for so many poorly considered pyramid theories. For example, how did the builders seal the ascending corridor with granite plugs? Maybe they climbed down the well shaft. How did looters know where to tunnel in? Maybe they climbed up the well shaft. How do we know giants didn't build the pyramids? They probably couldn't fit through the well shaft. But in all seriousness, the well shaft does lend itself as an excuse to stop reasonable inquiry about a fascinating subject. How was the pyramid sealed, and how was it plundered later on? Compounding my frustration is that there is scant physical evidence for us to examine, because imagery within the well shaft is extremely rare and always poor in quality due to the absence of light and it being a constrained space. Despite these limitations, I think we can reach some reasonable conclusions about the well shaft, even if we can't yet satisfy every answer for its ultimate purpose and design. Let's start with a brief overview of its layout, which is quite interesting because there are several sections and they all differ from each other quite a bit. Starting from the top, the upper well mouth is cut into the western bench at the bottom of the Grand Gallery. Interestingly, the well mouth does not take up the entire space of this lowest block in the bench, instead being only 68 centimeters long north to south, leaving an additional 57 centimeters of bench remaining on the northern side at the lowest point in the Grand Gallery. It's generally accepted that the original bench block here was standard for the Grand Gallery, making up the length of both the well mouth and the 57 centimeters of remaining bench below it. You can't infer too much from this design, however, because the builders may have found it easier and more structurally sound to install a standard block for the western bench and then cut into it for the well mouth. Leaving a gap for the mouth with a smaller stone supporting the bottom of the grand gallery might have been perceived as less ideal. The well mouth is the full width of the bench at 52 centimeters, plus another 15 centimeters of width into the wall of the grand gallery, making it nearly square. The well goes down less than a meter, then travels horizontally westward for another 1.4 meters before it opens to a square 68 centimeter aperture, which marks the point of its real descent. From this point, the well plunges vertically downward for 8 meters through the pyramid masonry. Then, the well makes about a 20 degree southward bend, so it is no longer vertical, for another 8 meters of distance before it reaches the foundation of the pyramid where it meets the bedrock. The well shaft then sharpens its angle back to vertical for the first 5.2 meters of depth into the Giza Plateau. The upper half of this vertical section is not solid bedrock, but instead 10 small courses of brick-sized masonry that wall off a small grotto. The grotto's walls and ceiling are made of compacted small rubble, which suggests the ten courses of masonry in the well shaft are put in place to protect the well from being clogged up from loose debris. The well shaft bricks being smooth and neat on the inner section, but rough and coarse on the grotto facing side, add to the evidence that the well is the priority, and that this masonry was set in place from the interior. Two meters below the grotto masonry, the well shaft once again bends horizontally to the south, this time at an even gentler slope. I can only estimate its angle from available diagrams at about 40 degrees less than vertical. After traveling another 26.5 meters down into the south, the shaft then steepens its angle once again to be only 15 degrees less than vertical. It then continues downward for a final 9.5 meters to its lowest depth. 
the lowest point of the well shaft is slightly deeper than the adjacent descending corridor, and it travels slightly upward and about two meters horizontally to the southeast to intersect the corridor. The lower mouth of the well shaft is smaller than the corridor itself, and was originally well squared with sides measuring 79 centimeters. It has been pointed out by many observers that the well shaft would have intersected the descending corridor at the very bottom, where it becomes horizontal, if the well shaft's lower section had not changed to a steeper angle. So, what to make of this curious and winding path from the near bottom of the pyramid's substructure to its busiest intersection at the base of the Grand Gallery? Many potential uses have been suggested, including as a reference line to help control the pyramid's alignment as it grew, and increased air circulation for the excavation of the subterranean chamber. I even see potential for spiritual explanations when looking at the closest similar feature in the bent pyramid, the so-called chimney that rises next to the lower chamber. But let's focus on the notion of the well shaft as a potential escape route for workers or secret backdoor entrance for looters. Looking at the path the well shaft takes, it quickly becomes obvious that connecting a point above the granite plugs to the descending corridor was not its primary function. If this was the case, the well shaft would have connected to the descending corridor below the plugs, but not all the way down near the subterranean chamber. The path it takes is unnecessarily long, and its excavation must have been difficult. There is no evidence that the descending corridor was plugged up, and so making the well shaft entrance farther down doesn't add to its security. Another observation is that the well shaft isn't designed so as to be overly difficult to climb. If the builders really wanted the well shaft to be a one-way exit, it would have been designed entirely vertical. The last workers to leave could climb a rope down 40 meters of vertical shaft and then set the rope on fire, leaving a formidable challenge to any potential climbers because a fall would be fatal. Instead, most of the well shaft is reasonably accommodating to a fit person with a manageable grade and plenty of footholds which are presumably original. This suggests that the well shaft would be a huge security flaw if not sealed up in some way. Many historians assume the lower entrance was closed and camouflaged based upon this vulnerability. In my video on the prism stone of the Great Pyramid, I discuss how the lower well entrance was probably disguised in later times after the pyramid had long been opened. The addition of loose debris, sand, and moisture filling up much of the descending corridor would make hiding it much easier. 19th century explorer Giovanni Caviglia was the first known person to open up the well since antiquity, and even he could not find the lower entrance until he had almost finished excavating the descending corridor and the well shaft from above. But disguising the lower well entrance with the descending corridor in pristine condition would have been much more difficult, and there's no evidence to suggest it could or was done effectively. The only remaining method of securing the well shaft is closing it from above, and there is plenty of evidence to suggest this was accomplished. The damage to the upper mouth of the well is quite conspicuous, and shows evidence of destruction from above rather than from within. The 57 centimeters of bench below the well mouth are greatly damaged in its upper portion, which would not have occurred from someone breaking in from below. Furthermore, researchers Maraccioglio and Rinaldi observe that the damage in this section shows no sign of chiseling, in contrast to the chisel marks within the well shaft leading to the upper entrance. The damage to the mouth of the well and its adjacent block are from hammering, demonstrating the contrast between how the well was constructed versus how it was opened. And what of the final possibility that the builders managed to close the upper well mouth from below, still using the well shaft as a final escape route? Looking at the upper entrance, it seems designed as if to make this task as difficult as possible. You can't slide a block down from the bench itself because it would tip over before falling into place. The size of the block would be more than half a cubic meter, up to 1350 kilograms or 3000 pounds. The only remaining option would be to pull it into place laterally, 
but the inner workspace is so small that only one or two workers would be able to maneuver it. This presents so many problems that I don't think it's necessary to mention them in detail. If you want to design an opening that can be closed from below, you do it just like you see at the bottom of the ascending corridor with a nice smooth grade and a soft landing for heavy plugging stones. The Great Pyramid already does this, and so suggesting the builders couldn't close a well-designed corridor from below, but were able to accomplish this for an awkward enclosed space with sharp angles doesn't make any sense. The well shaft was certainly sealed before the granite plugging stones were lowered into place, and it did not serve as a final escape route for workers. The damage to the upper well mouth is evidence of breaking in from above, and so the well couldn't have been the first point of entry for plunderers to gain access to the upper chambers of the pyramid. I feel confident in these conclusions, and it's important knowledge to possess when examining the question of how the pyramid was first violated in the ancient past. Retracing the steps and methods of the original robbers has been my fascination for a long time. With this examination of the well shaft, along with my previous video on the prism stone, we are now ready to properly investigate the robbers' tunnel. It will be my pleasure to show you exactly how I think the Great Pyramid was first entered, why the robber's tunnel is so accurately designed, and the logic of looting the pyramid as quickly and effectively as possible. And for those of you who think they already know these answers, I promise an entirely new take on the robber's tunnel with unexamined evidence written in stone. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Please subscribe to the channel to see more of this content, give a like or comment as you see fit, and above all, remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granted.